found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul, to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Alleluia, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul, to my soul. He'll never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will, blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul doth fill. Soul doth fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. Alleluia, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul, to my soul.
everyone, this is Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Escape from Prison. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. Today's message is, at church, we learn that Jesus is most important. It was too much. The leaders of the Jews could not believe what was happening. Didn't we order Peter and the other apostles to quit teaching about Jesus? They asked each other. But they are still teaching, and now they are doing miracles. Crowds of sick people stream into the city every day, and everybody is being healed. The temple leaders were angry. The high priest and the Sadducees believed that they had to stop the apostles. So they arrested them and sent them to prison. They thought that that would give the apostles some time to think. Maybe then they would stop all this talk about Jesus. They had to stop telling people that Jesus rose from the dead. The Sadducees did not believe that anyone could come back to life. They did not believe in angels either. God must have smiled about that. That night, he sent an angel to let the apostles out of prison. Go back to the temple and tell the people all about this new life in Jesus, the angel said. Of course, the apostles happily obeyed, and very early in the morning, they went to the temple and began teaching again. But others were busy that morning, too. The high priest and the Sadducees called all the other important leaders together. They sent orders to the prison to have the apostles brought to them. In a short time, the men who had been sent to the prison came back. Their eyes were wide with fear. We found the jail securely locked, they reported. The guards were standing at the doors, but, but, but we found no prisoners inside. The leaders shook their heads. What now? Then word came in from the streets. Look, the men you put in prison are back in the temple courts, and they are teaching the people again. Grinding their teeth, the leaders sent more men to the temple. When the apostles finally stood before the leaders, the high priest glared at them. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He shouted, Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. You must stop. The apostles answered plainly, We must obey God rather than men, they said. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, the same Jesus you had killed by hanging him on a cross. God has made him a prince and a savior. He will give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. The leaders shook with anger. They really wanted to have the apostles put to death, but they could not. Too many people believed that these were God's men, and through it all, the apostles stood firm. Jesus was more important to them than their own lives.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you for this day. We thank you that we are still alive and well in this very difficult time of the coronavirus and other things that are going around. But uh, you have seen it fit that we should be meeting here today. Father, I don't want to say my own words to your children. I've got notes, but I ask Father that you lead me out of the notes and to say the things that you would like me to say. So take us into your hands and take me into your hands. Take my brain, take my tongue. May all things be done to your honor and glory. And may we bring a blessing to your children today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did I unmute myself? Okay. Okay. It isn't over yet. Uh, Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. And um, our scripture for today is found in Luke chapter 19, verses 12 to 17. In the King James Version, which I'm sure many of you remember from childhood, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds. And he said unto them, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Uh, I like it in the King James Version, but I think I like it even better in the New King James Version. It says, verse 12, therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to re receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minus, and said to them, do business till I come. I just like that. Do business till I come. Okay, now... Uh, Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3, God's call to Abraham. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I just love that. Substance is what you can touch, what you can feel. And evidence is something that is used in court, where you speak about something that you've either seen or heard. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And from this slide, I'm going to skip to slide seven. Uh, the call of Abraham. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, I hope you have your Bibles. We are going to do quite a bit of Bible reading, and you can turn to these in your own Bible. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a promise. Now, where was Abram called from? 
He said, live your, leave your country and leave your people. And in order to understand where Abram was from, let us go back a little bit. Let us go to Genesis chapter 10. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 12. Cush. Now, let me remind you, of course, who Cush is. Cush is your father. Cush is the father of the black race. Cush begot Nimrod. So Nimrod was your brother. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. You know, uh, this is so wonderful to hear uh, this being said because it looks like the children of Shem didn't like Cush a lot. They said a lot of uh, negative things about him. But Moses, who knew him better, is only saying positive things about him. Like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now the children of Shem try to change that a little bit and make it say, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter, hunter against the Lord. How can you be a hunter against the Lord? So he was a mighty hunter uh, before the Lord. And, his, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kelna in the land of China. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, rehoboth Ir, Kela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela, the principal city. That was Nimrod. So he built all of those cities, but he was not quite satisfied. Let us hear uh, what his suggestions were to the other children of Noah. Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9. We skip over now from chapter 10 to chapter 11 because we're trying to understand where Abraham was from. What type of a place was he from? It says here, uh, verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. So that was an invention of bricks there, uh, whereas they used to use stone before. Here is an invention of brick. And then instead of using mortar, that is daga, they are using asphalt. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. You know, what entrepreneurship, what, what, what vision. But of course, this has been turned around and spoken evil of, and that is a topic of another day. We'll discuss that on another day. But uh, uh, vision here, let us build ourselves a city and a skyscraper whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now there, that goes against uh, what God said when he created man. He said they should fill the earth. Now, the tallest building in the world today is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. We Americans feel uh, sort of, you know, a little bit uh, put off because we used to have the highest buildings in New York. But now the tallest building in the world is not here. It is in Dubai, the Burj Khalifa. The building that Nimrod built, though, dwarfed the Burj Khalifa. The Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world with a height of 2,716.5 feet. Its total height from the tip to the base is 2,723 feet or 829.8 meters to you who are in South Africa. The building has 163 floors located above the ground and only one floor located below the ground. 
It has 58 functional elevators, which run at a top speed of 10 meters per second. There are 304 hotels and 900 ap apartments in the building. But ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to propose that the building that Nimrod put up was even higher than that because his was to, supposed to go into the heavens. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do now. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld with, from them. Why was that so? Because they were created in the image of God. They were able to do great things. So uh, God said, let us go down there and confuse their languages and scatter them uh, in the earth. And so he confused their languages. And who did he use to scatter them? Nimrod. He built all of those cities, scattering the children of Noah. Now, Abraham then came from one of these cities. Now, how were these cities? I turn to the SDA Bible commentary regarding life in Mesopotamia, the social class structure that is in volume one, page 155. Uh, the social structure there, they had three classes. Uh, there was the Western Semitic nobility. Abraham was a Semite, so he belonged to that class. Then there were the free citizens of Semitic and Sumerian populations, and then there were slaves. Now they did agriculture, and I mentioned this because uh, further down the line we'll find Abraham suffering hunger. He says, most land belonged to the crown, the temples, and the rich merchants. Abraham obviously came from that class, the rich class. They're a class of merchants and uh, the class of rulers. And the, the produce there in Mesopotamia was barley and wheat. So they had a lot of barley and wheat. Uh, they did irrigation during the dry season. Uh, they irrigated the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers and used technology that is still in use in Iraq today. That is how sophisticated they were. They used little boats for traffic and bigger boats for traveling far away and commerce was booming. They traded with many countries around them. Now coming to town life and home life. Uh, their houses uh, had foundations and the foundations were built of burnt brick. And then the walls were built of sun-baked bricks. And uh, the houses in the towns were usually double-story houses. They had double-story houses in Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldees and in Babylon especially. And then there would be a staircase that leads from the ground floor all the way to the second floor and out to the roof so that in the hot summer days they could sleep out there on top of the roof. And uh, uh, sophistication was very high. The city was scientifically designed. They had streets, they had city blocks. The streets were not always as straight as our streets today, but the streets ran right through the, uh, the cities. So quite uh, uh, a culture that Abraham came from. He didn't just come from uh, the boondocks when he was called by God to go to this land. What was the religion like? The religion, the religion was polytheistic. They worshiped many gods and uh, they also worshiped idols. Now let us go back to the call of Abraham. Uh, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 6 and 5 to 6 and the promise that was made to Abraham. 12, now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now, this was pretty uh, 
uh, attractive to Abraham and his br brother uh, uh, Haran because they were living in the city. But now they are going to inherit a country. Haran went along and said, well, the Lord has called my brother, but I'm sure when I get there, I could also get a farm. Unfortunately, he died on the way. But it says here that, uh, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lord went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. You remember, he was the last born in the family. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. I'd like you to pay a special attention here uh, as to what it says here. It says, uh, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. While they were waiting for the promise to be fulfilled, they did business or they occupied, as the King James Version said. Uh, number six, Abram passed through the land to the place of Sheshan, as far as the Tabernacle tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham comes to Canaan, and he walks around, and he looks around the land that has been promised, and uh, in his heart he might have said, wow, I can't believe it, this is all mine. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Verse eight, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. He has turned his back on polytheism. He's turned his back on uh, uh, worshiping idols. Verse 9, so Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south, surveying this land that the Lord is giving him. In the promised land, but not yet possessing it. The promise of possession has not yet been fulfilled. Now, uh, enriched while waiting. Verse 10, now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife. Now, let me just take a little aside here. You know, we were doing uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we speak about the heroes of faith. But after we went through each one of those heroes of faith, I came to the conclusion that they were not heroes of faith. They were heroes of grace. They were not perfect people. They had character flaws, just like we have character flaws. But in the book of Hebrews 11, none of their flaws are mentioned. Only their good is mentioned, and that tells me that when we appear before the Lord, we'll be clothed with the robe of Jesus Christ, and only our good will be mentioned, but our bad will not be seen. Now listen to what Abraham does. Listen to this. Verse 11, and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Now, let me say something else there a little bit, just to clarify, give background to this here. The Egyptians were swarthy. Uh, Sister White uses the word swarthy, or they were black. 
and uh, the Mesopotamians were light-skinned. And uh, it would appear that Sarah was a blue-eyed blonde. Such people were not common in Egypt, and uh, so they look different. And you know that we're attracted to what looks different. So Abram was scared that when they came to Egypt, he must have seen Egyptians before, he was afraid that when they see this beautiful woman, they would kill him and take her. Listen to what he says to his wife. Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princess of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Now, something very difficult to understand here for most of us, but it might be a reflection of what life was like in Mesopotamia. Maybe some of the theorists in South Africa and around the world were happening even back then in Mesopotamia. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And uh, listen what happens. He treated Abram well for her sake. In South African, we would say uh, he gave Abram good lobola for who he thought was his sister. Now, lobola is a South African word for uh, bright price. Uh, what uh, the man pays to the girl's father before he can marry her. So he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants. I suppose that's where they got Hagar, female donkeys and camels. So not possessing the promised land yet, but amassing wealth in the meantime while waiting. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Abraham's wife. I'd like you to note here that it is God who intervened. And we'll see later on again how often God intervenes and how God intervenes in our lives. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai. Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. And he didn't say, bring back the cattle, bring back the sheep, bring back the, the servants. He let him go with everything that he had given him. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Isn't God great? While waiting, all of this is happening to him. And so now he goes back to Canaan. But this time around now, will he possess it? Will he possess Canaan? I like it in the Bible there. You know, they have those uh, headings. And the heading here says, Abram inherits Canaan. Now, let us analyze this. Let us study it and find out if he actually inherited Canaan this time around. Genesis 13, verses 1 to 4. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and something very interesting here. He and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. It's interesting that speaking mostly uh, to the sons of Cush. 
that Abraham apparently went down to the land of Cush. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. I'd like you also to remember that where Abraham came from, they lived in houses and those houses had strong foundations and they had walls. Those houses were double-storied houses and here he was living in tents. Whereas he slept on a bed in Mesopotamia, here he slept on the grass in a tent. So then, he went back to, you know, to as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. What an example. I hope that the altars, the prayer altars in our families are standing firm, that they're there for morning worship and they're there also for evening worship. Then Genesis 15, verse 1 to 21, promise number three, while he's in Canaan, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? You know, I've been around here for a while now. I don't see anything happening. Uh, you promised me land, you promised me the offspring. But Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And the church said, Amen. Because Abraham had seen nothing yet. He has not seen the land belonging to him. He has not seen even one offspring and God tells him that now you are going to inherit all of this and your offspring is going to fill this whole land. And he believes. And he believes. And because he believes, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? You know, I've gone uh, to the, from the north to the south, then back from the south to the north. I'm still here. I'm not owning it yet. How do I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon, then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Uh, you know, uh, pardon me, blame it on my age, you know, uh, keeping digressing a little bit this way and that way. But uh, when I was going to um, Lobola for my son, uh, they said to me, we want so many cows, uh, but the last cow should be a living, walking cow. And that one we're going to slaughter and we're going to divide into two parts, one part on one side, one part on the other side. And then we, the two families, will walk between those two carcasses and of course, I became very suspicious. I said, oops, 
ancestor worship until I read in the Bible that no, it comes from the Bible. So Abraham cut them in two. And now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, that's God, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Wow, what has happened to the promise now? Now we hear about them serving another nation, and for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Let me just check my time. Okay, my wife says I'm still doing fine. So now what happened to the promise? Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. We read that one. And what God told him that there would be, his offspring would be uh, foreigners in a strange land yet. So, not yet, Abraham, not yet. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So God himself came and walked between those pieces of the carcasses. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kedmozites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gushagites, and the Jebusites. So Abraham is excited when he hears all of this although confused, really, he has no offspring yet. So, being impatient with the promise, Hagar enters the picture. Genesis 16, verses 1 to 16, 1 to 4, I'm sorry. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Verse 3, then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, despised in her eyes. Now we go to promise number 6 the sign of the continent. Verse 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, you remember he left at 75, he's now 99, not received the promise yet. I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Uh, all right, now I am stuck. What happened? No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you, 
and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. Now he's a stranger. All the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? No land, no heir. But he did not know that it is not over yet. The best is still to come. So promise number six, no land yet, no heir, is it over? Genesis 18 verse 9 says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. So they are old. It's over. Or is it over? Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Promises, promises, promises. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That's another sermon. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Genesis 21 to 17, and Abram journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abram said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Deja vu. And Abraham, Abimelech, king of Gareth, sent and took Sarah. And Abram, I'm so sorry, and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had, to, had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. So Abram was so scared in the land of promise that he was willing again to hand over his wife. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. I'm just watching my town keeper. Ah, okay. We are getting there. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife. For he is a prophet. And he will pray for you. And you shall live. But if you... Do not restore you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants. Okay, my internet is unstable again. And told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abram, uh, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? And then Abram 
uh, makes excuses and tells him why he did what he did. And uh, he told his uh, 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 story as to why he said Sarah is his sister. And, uh, but I like verse 14, then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. My land is before you. Dwell here. It, uh, it pleases you. I mean, dwell, dwell where it pleases you. Uh, so he says, see, my land is before you. Abimelech didn't know who he was talking to. Uh, just um, a little story here that Nelson Mandela told. Uh, he said, uh, uh, once after he had just come out of prison, uh, they were invited to come to Paragwanath Hospital. And so the nurses were excited the patients were excited. They were to told that Mandela is coming. Nelson Mandela is coming uh, so soon after being released from prison. And so there was a nurse there, uh, a charged nurse, who was busy uh, clearing the room, uh, putting the people in order and so forth, because the time was close for Nelson Mandela to arrive. And after she had put everybody in place, she turned around and here was this little group of old men uh, standing where she had removed people from. And so she went back to those people. If I could have said it in Zulu, you'd have understand it better. But she said to those old men, please, old men, can't you hear? Can't you stand back? Please stand back. Nelson Mandela is coming. And the old men stood back sheepishly. And so everything was now organized and in order. And uh, so the superintendent of the hospital came forward and said, we're so very happy today uh, because Nelson Mandela has come to visit us. And he gave a little introduction and a little speech about Nelson Mandela, all his great deeds. And then he turned around and he said, Mandela. And then from among that group of old men that this nurse has sued away, walks out Nelson Mandela. He was one of those old men that she shooed away. She did not recognize him. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Abimelech did not know who he was talking to when he spoke to Abraham about his land that was before him. Uh, Dwell where it pleases you, he said, verse 16. Then to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus, she was rebuked. All right. Now, uh, I did have a feeling that I was not going to uh, <laughs> be able to finish the sermon in the time given. Uh, let me just go to the, tell you what, it, what my intention was. My intention was to show you how Abraham in the promised land, while waiting to possess it, went around and never actually possessing it. Then he had Isaac, and I was going to show you how Isaac now came around. And after Abraham had died, he too went up and down, being persecuted in the land of promise, but he too acquired a lot of wealth while all of this was happening. And then came Jacob. And when Jacob came, he could only buy a piece of land on which his tent stood in the promised land. So they never actually inherited the promised land. But while they were in the promised land, they did business. Now, uh, let me quickly go to uh, the end. And all of this is what we couldn't say. But uh, I knew that it would take maybe three or four sermons to speak about all of these. Uh,
Okay. So there they buried Abram and Sarah, his wife. Uh, this was Jacob talking when he was dying, and he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last, and Jacob also died. Finally, the children of Israel go to the promised land, but did they ever possess it? No, they never actually possessed it, even though Joshua led them into the promised land. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have spoken of another day. So they never got that rest that was promised, and we wonder why. Now here is the why. Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Three generations together in tents, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. You know, when I first came to America, uh, I was quite stunned because children had to leave their home at the age of 18. When a child turned 18, that was when they finished high school and uh, they were expected now to leave, uh, to go and start life on their own because high school, high school diploma was the diploma in those days. So when I came to Loma Linda then, uh, I worked uh, in dispatch, there was a beautiful girl who worked with us and her mother also came and worked with us. She was 18 years old and about to finish high school. And her mother said to me, uh, oh, by the way, she's going to move out now. And I said, where is she going to move out to? And she said, she's going to move out to her own apartment. And I said, such a beautiful, pretty young girl moving out to her own apartment. That was American culture back then at 18. Then in 2008 came the great disaster and people lost jobs left and right. Inflation was, uh, or unemployment was at double digits. And then you were lucky if your child left home at the age of 30. Here was Abraham. He was not only with his son in the tent, but he was there with his son's son in the tents, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And it wasn't fulfilled. So it says then, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why? Verse 10. Now we find out later on. For he waited for the city which has foundations. You remember he came from a city that had foundations? And then he lived in tents without the foundation. Now he is waiting for a city which has foundations whose builder, builder and maker is God. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them. I just love that word there. They embraced them like they could feel them. They loved them. They embraced those promises and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come, that sophisticated country of Ur of the Chaldees, they would have opportunity to return. Nobody was forcing them. They could have returned. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Revelation 21 verse 1, 
Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. You know, uh, especially now, we in South Africa have had a very similar experience for 300 years. We were in a foreign land, and finally we thought we'd arrived in the promised land. But even though we are in the promised land, really, we have not yet uh, uh, taken it. In other words, I'm losing the word there. We, uh, uh, we have not possessed it yet. And that is what I was going to speak about. And I hope if I get another chance, we will start from there because that is really what I was driving to. Now in this home that Abraham has found and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. This takes me back, Brother Zuzo, to what you said in the beginning. All these things that we're suffering right now, that we're talking about, the things that we go through uh, in our homes, the things that we go through even in our countries, scary things that we're going through, we know that we're foreigners and strangers here. We're looking forward to that country whose foundations whose maker is God himself. May God bless us then as we hang on, as we wait for the fulfillment of the promise. Oh, there goes my internet again. For soon, it will be uh, fulfilled. May the Lord bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our gracious Father in heaven, we didn't have time to finish the sermon, but in the beginning we asked that we will just say what you wanted us to say. And Father, we hope that we have said it. We hope that it has blessed your children and that it has blessed us also, Father, if me, the speaker. We ask you, Father, to give us patience and to give us uh, endurance and uh, to give us diligence to work while we are guests in this foreign land that we thought was our promised land. And Father, in the end, when Jesus comes, may we and all those that we have worked for be gathered into your kingdom. Bless all families represented here today. But I ask you to uh, uh, pronounce a special blessing on the Zuzo family who had taken the time and the effort to organize such a beautiful program. Father, take them into your hands and help that we too will spread it wherever we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. They tell me of a home far away. And they tell me of a home where the storm clouds rise. Tell me that my life shall be 
Jesus.